but I still had that dream that I wanted to go to law school. And I eventually did go to college. I went to East Carolina University. I graduated with a 2.0 GPA. And uh, I was living in Japan at the time. And it was time to apply for uh, colleges, uh, for law school. And I knew my grades weren't good in high school. I told you my grades weren't there. And I knew my grades weren't good in college. I took the LSAT, which is the entry exam to get into law school. And I got in the bottom 98 percentile of that exam. So I knew I wasn't going to be able to go to Harvard, Yale, or Princeton, or some Ivy League law school. So I did some research and found out that there's 450 accredited law schools in North America. So I researched the bottom 37 law schools, like the easiest law schools to get in. And the reason why it was 37 law schools is I had $4,000 to my name. I'm living in this little village in Japan working for the Olympics. Each application was about $100 a pop. So I had $3,700 for applications and $300 for postage, all I can afford. So I researched the easiest 37 law schools to get into. And this happened about 15, 18 years ago, and I didn't tell anybody about this until I wrote a book. And I wrote this chapter about this story, and now I tell people all over the world, and it's exciting, and it's pretty humbling. But um, this is the original file of uh, the 37 rejection letters of the worst law schools in North America, every one of them. Every one of them. I mean, I didn't even know there was 37 ways to tell someone to go take a hike or get lost in a polite way. But every single law school, the worst, easiest law schools in the country, rejected. I'm going to mention some of these law schools that I applied to. And I apologize to the locked in audience if any of you uh, went here, and this is your alma mater, because your law school is like total crap. But um, Mercer University and Gonzaga University, Detroit University, Capital University, Creighton. And this is my favorite law school of all time. I went to school at East Carolina University. And I learned about this little African-American college called North Carolina Central University. All African-American. But I did some research and they had a minority scholarship. And I thought if I applied as a white guy, I might get in. But I got rejected there as well. Every one of these damn law schools. And we laugh about it now, but when, you know, when you're a kid and all you think about your entire life was to go to law school and then you get rejected to every one of them, you're thinking about what the heck I want to do with my life. And I have a most beautiful, amazing, humble wife. And what she's done to me is incredible. She's transformed me because for the last eight years, I go to bed with her and I lay down and she looks at me and then she gives me this feedback on how I can improve myself. And she basically <laughs> says, what a jerk I am. And she says, Tommy, I've been married to you for eight years. And, you know, she said this when I first started dating her, when I was first engaged to her, when we first got married. She said, Tommy, I don't know anybody that knows more people in the world than you. You're totally successful. You're, you hit a home run at IBM. Now you started this nonprofit, and it's one of the largest in the state of Colorado, and you're changing the world. You've networked. You meet all these people. But if I can just give you this feedback, you got this chip on your shoulder, like you're trying to prove to that goddamn guidance counselor back in high school that you're not stupid. I mean... Get the chip off your shoulder. There's something about you that you could just bless so many people and serve so many people if you live life more authentically. And you don't enter a room thinking who you can meet to help your nonprofit or help your sales or build your network of networking. But you can actually build relationships that are beyond these manipulative tactics that Dale Carnegie talks about. I'm not saying this book is terrible. It's a great book. It's a great read. But if you live your life and you build your business with these manipulative tactics that if I do these things, look in the eye, shake your hand, speak about your interests, basically kiss your butt so you like me and I can manipulate you to influence you to buy my product, you might make that top 100 list. You might make your numbers, but you're not going to have lifelong clients and customers, the ones that are going to stick with you through the ups and downs of the economies. And you're not going to have the genuine lifelong relationships that I've actually discovered the last five or six years of my life. Many of us have first floor relationships. We have them every day. Very transactional. They go to Starbucks, get a coffee. How are you? I'm fine. Transaction. Go to the bank teller. Transaction. Maybe move up to the second floor relationship, which what I call NSW relationships, which we're very good at, especially men. News, sports, weather relationships. All you talk about is news, sports, weather, because you can't get beyond the small talk. You might have clients that all you talk about is that, and that in business. Then you move to the third floor relationship where you're asking more questions and you're sharing a little bit of personal information. But I talk about in the book in organizations and salespeople that actually build what I call fourth and fifth floor penthouse relationships with your customers and clients. And when you have fifth floor relationships with your customer and clients, you think about their interest. You know about their business. You know about their family. You know about their kid that has a cocaine addiction and that 
that he opened up and shared that with you. You know everything about them. You help serve them, you help honor them beyond selling them property and casualty and benefits and the locked in way and the locked in model and the locked in insurance. Beyond that, you know them inside and out and you care about them and they know they care about you. Those are fifth floor relationships. And many of you have clients that have that. And many of you still have clients that are still on the first, second, and third floor. And I want to talk about some of the stories of organizations I work with that uh, demonstrate the fourth and fifth floor service. 